I was just thinking about the first time I came in here and it must have been a fairly new hall because we used to have the rural cinema then when I was a child just as you have, we have it now and I come again except that the film used to be shown at that end of the hall so I think I'm looking back to about 1949 or 50 and this place was only put up in 48 so um, it's heading, I'm heading for my centenary, I think, as well. Um, and now, I'd better start soon, because there's an awful lot of information. I reckon I'll have to cut bits out, because I've got so much, I'm trying to, like, to sort of pattern that I can follow through. And from time to time, my long-suffering husband, who's over there with my ancient equipment, um, is going to put up some slides for us. I hope you can see those. Um, I've brought my school teacher's cane so that I can point things out. But I shall ask him to put them up um, when they fit in with the story. And I don't want really to talk about that for a, a few moments. So um, I'm waiting for um, the filmmaker to tell me that I can start talking. Yes, he says I can start talking properly. Uh, the early morning of Wednesday, the 5th of August, 1914, was a gloomy one and the rain kept coming in over this, from this direction from Four Oaks. I've got to reorientate myself. Over the fields from Four Oaks, diagonally, hitting the edge of the school and the edge of the uh, church on the hill. It was very gloomy indeed. So I want you really to have a look at um, the pictures because... I want you to imagine a little bit about Meriden Green at that time before I move on. And I will say a little bit about the village um, and what it was like. I've got four pictures and I want to point out just one or two things. Now, it's quite hard unless you know something of the past to see where this is perhaps. But thankfully, we've got the Thatch Cottage, which is still there. Now, during the war, you'd imagine they'd all be thinking a great deal about the war, but in fact, they were often on the parish council having a go about the finger post. It's amazing the number of times the finger post came up and they wanted, somebody wanted to move it or it was falling apart. Here is the position, not the original position, because that was somewhere down the village, but this is the position where the cross was before it was moved for the Queen's coronation time. And this part here no longer stands. But I was just talking to one of many people I know in the room because she came up and had a word with me because her father was born in that cottage, the end there, um, during the Great War. Could we have the next one, please, Rodney? This is looking in the opposite direction. And again, um, this featured in the same family because here was the blacksmith shop. And this was a blacksmith shop. All these pictures are 100 years old or more. And this one is an old postcard, so I can't guarantee its age, but it is a very old one because of what it shows. Behind here is Elm Tree Farm. Here is the elm tree, which was a tree but divided into two, two trunks. Part of it fell down in 1923. And I often date pictures by whether it's there as a complete tree or not. But that is looking down towards Coventry. Could we have the next one, please, Rodney? Now, we're looking back in the direction we first started, because here's the thatch cottage. And I've put in, of course, lots of bicycles because they feature in the story, and even a motorbike. This picture is about 1909, and I want to often mention somewhere called the Woodyard, which if you're an old resident, you will know exactly where it is, but if you're a new one, you'll think, where's she talking about? And it's here, this part, several houses, was the Woodyard. Next one, Rodney, and then we'll go on to something else. And this is, again, looking in the opposite direction. On the green, original position for this. Here's the blacksmiths, different time of year. So you can see the elm tree. You can see Elm Tree Farm much better. And here, we should be talking a little bit about the man who was the butcher there 
Um, I don't think any descendants of his, I haven't seen them this evening, but a descendant of his is still in the village. Um, that was uh, Francis or Frank Jones's butcher's shop at the time we're speaking about. And Frank Jones was a rather important member of the village. He features in all sorts of documents. Now, the people of Meriden were not really too worried, actually, I think, about the Great War, because the bank holiday had just taken place, and everybody was having a good time. Um, Meriden joined up for this um, I think vegetable and flower show. It's called the Meriden Show sometimes, with Hampton in Arden and Great Packington. And on the bank holiday Saturday, that is the Saturday before the war was declared, they had had this uh, jollification in the grounds of Meriden Hall. And uh, Captain uh, Banks, who was married to the owner of the hall, um, won the first prize for his peas. And as my husband said, I bet he hadn't really grown them. It would have been Johnny Greaves, the head gardener, who would have grown the peas, but he got the first prize. And I think it's indicative of the rainy season that had been, because peas, as you country people know, all grow very well if we have plenty of rain. The rain, of course, had made it difficult for other crops, and a number of farmers were still <coughs> struggling with their hay crop, although I gather it cheered up a bit during August, and there was not so much problem with the other harvests that had to be collected in. But there you've got a little bit of picture of the village um, on the green, and a little bit about the people. But I'm going to talk to you a lot more, really, about the village so you get a picture of it in broader detail. Um, there were only 832 people on the census for 1911. And we can deduct quite a few of those because 100 of them were in the workhouse. And they would, very few of them were Meriden people. They came from the 18 parishes around because the Meriden, what was later the rural district and was then the Meriden Union, included 18 parishes. But people from further away who just happened for personal reasons to have drifted into the area were also in the workhouse. I'll be talking a bit more about it in a moment or two. So we have um, 100 people out of the 832 <coughs> in the workhouse. And we also have about 120 children, so we can't count those in the adult population. So we haven't got a very large adult population, 400 and something people. And then we have to divide it into men and women. And I'm thinking about the people who will actually offer to fight in the war within the first two years. We haven't got too many people to draw upon. The village actually was socially very divided. It was a poor village. I'll give you an example of how poor. Um, during 1916, when the rural district was collecting war funds, it collected from each of the villages, and I was able to collect the amount of money for each parish. I'm not going to give you 18 totals. I'm going to give you Meridans versus two others. <coughs> Hampton in Arden and Berkswell, and neighbouring parishes, each collected £200. Meriden collected just over £6.50. <laughs> and I don't think the people were mean. I think that they just hadn't got the money on balance. Of course, there were a few people with money, but even they, when you look at their wills, were not stupendously wealthy. Um, Meriden Hall, with Captain and Mrs Banks, she was a Miss Digby, and they obviously had money to maintain a house of that size, and they had got a large estate outside the village. But only one farm, that is the Hornwood, on the middle, in the middle of um, Meriden Heath, no longer there. And then um, at Meriden House, there was Colonel Monkton, and he had been adopted by the Witchcoats. You may have heard me mention the Witchcoats, because they're quite famous. But they had a certain amount of money. And one or two of the other large houses, of course, Darleston Hall, which uh, was the home of the doctor, uh, Dr. Smith, though he always used one of his baptismal names so that it looked as if it was a double barrel. And he's known as William Harvey Smith, but Harvey was only his second baptismal name. He and his wife, 
reasonably well off. I mean, they leave a few thousands, but these aren't very rich people. And there are one or two others, which I won't go into detail. I haven't got time. But most people were quite poor. Um, so you've got people um, who are very, very actually enterprising. You've got a number of people who've got businesses. I mentioned the butcher, um, and he's quite enterprising. And we've got the Warmingham family, who for many years, in fact, there is one under um, another name, of course, because it's a, a female. But the Warmingham family uh, came to this village in 1879 and were important throughout the whole of the last century uh, in one way or another. And, and they had a shop. So there were people with shops who made a reasonable living. But most people, most ordinary men, were working on farms. And I think we'd like just... Um, no, I think I'll leave the, the, those for a moment. I'd better carry on with talking. Um, the, the farms had... Um, with the mixed farms, dairying and uh, potatoes and hay and things of that sort. They were very labour-intensive. So the, imagine there was adequate work for most people, but remember we're perhaps only talking about 200 or less men if we take the men who didn't need to work, um, you know, the doctors and people like that who didn't work out on the farm, but people working on the farm quite poor. Within the village as well, um, the the enterprising men who considered that they must look after their families, um, they had joined um, a, a group, a society, a friendly society, we would call it today, um, known as the Odd Fellows. Some of you may have heard of Odd Fellows, because they still exist today. But virtually every working man in the village aspired to joining the Odd Fellows, and you paid in a small amount of money. And then if disaster struck, because we're dealing with a, a world which has hardly moved into the age of old age pensions or unemployment benefits. Lloyd George's benefits were only for a limited number of people and they were hardly um, on the move because they were only made in 1911. So you joined and you joined, if you could, the Odd Fellows. And I often wondered, and I'll be honest with you, I've only just found out why, they were called the Loyal Newdigate Lodge. And I knew that that was their name, but I often wondered why, and perhaps some people in the room do know, but I didn't, and I obviously didn't ask. But I found out while I was preparing this talk, <coughs> and apparently Sir Francis Newdigate um, lived in the village in the 1880s for a short time, um, and he lived in the house that the Kitty Masters had built next door to the church on top of the hill. And I think he wanted to help the people of the village, possibly about the time he'd moved away. He wanted to leave some sort of present. And you could see that the odd fellows were really on their knees. They'd got no money at all. The accounts showed that there was no money in the coffers. And so in 1894, he gave 20 pounds, which is a lot of money then, to try and set them up. And they really worked very hard. So that by the time we're talking about, and we'll show you some slides uh, shortly, of the Odd Fellows, they had um, a fete every summer. And I think that was July, so they all would have had their fete in July of 1914. And the men, very exclusive society in those days, men only had a big dinner at the Bull's Head Hotel. And there were about 100 blokes um, having this dinner and no doubt beer and all the rest of it. And you see ladies in the road outside watching the, the festival because there's a great big banner. I've got a photograph and I recently <coughs> bought a postcard which shows them in the street. On a rainy day, the ladies have all got umbrellas and it's round about the time we're speaking about. So we've got quite a poor village, but one where people try to look after themselves and I think that would probably be true of other villages as well. When I've talked a little bit about how the news of the Great War possibly came, we'll have a little selection of slides again, and you'll see for yourselves about the Odd Fellows, and you'll also see things about the workhouse as well, though I do want to say a little bit more about that independently. So how did the news of the Great War get into the village? Unfortunately, I failed to ask anybody. I used to go collecting oral history when I was about 14. 
but I never asked anybody how they knew. It didn't seem very much like history to me, and I've always been far more interested in the Tudors or the Middle Ages, so it, it seemed as though it was yesterday. But I can make a fairly shrewd guess, I think. Can we have the next picture, Rodney, and then we can just have a sequence of how we learnt about the, the uh, history. Now, these photographs are 100 years old or over, so do forgive me if they're not as bright and cheerful as they might be. But this, of course, as you can probably see or guess, is the main road, the hill, going down towards the village. And it would seem pretty obvious that because they knew in Coventry um, late on the evening of the 4th of August that newspapers, local newspapers, like the Coventry Herald, are likely to have come in a cart, horse and cart. No motor vehicle would have brought the newspapers, but carts came down, and they came from Coventry, and they would bring the Coventry newspaper. So people um, are waiting for their newspapers. Could we have the next one, please, Rodney? Now, this is the post office, and, of course, it still stands. It's no longer the post office, but it says here... Meriden Post Office. And here is the postmistress. This was somewhere where a woman was running the business. So I think she was quite tough. She'd been <coughs> running the business since about 1892 when she married Mr Sidwell, who is the man who did all the postcards of the village and of all the surrounding villages as well. Um, here's the postman, and here's her little boy, but I presume her husband is the person taking the picture. Now, she had the post coming in, and she may well have had a few other things. She may have taken a few newspapers. I don't know. She certainly hadn't got the telephone. In fact, you know, I haven't found anybody with the telephone, and I've gone through the telephone directories for this time, but even Meriden Hall doesn't seem to have had a telephone. But she would have had the telegraph. And we know from Stone Lee, because somebody kept a diary there, uh, that the Stone Lee post office waited up until midnight to see what news was coming in from London. So, of course, uh, Mrs Sidwell, Zilla Sidwell, might have stopped up and listened because she certainly <coughs> had got a telegraph, but I just don't know. Inside there, she also sold her husband's postcards and stamps and knick-knacks. If people came to the village and wanted a souvenir, she sold those. And I actually own one. It's a very precious position, and I wish we'd got a museum, because I'm getting old, and I wonder what's going to happen to it when I'm no longer around, because it ought to come back home. It would be nice to think the person who gave it me gave it me hoping I'd care for it, knowing I'd care for it. Anyway, could we have the next picture, Rodney, please? Because we're going up the village. And we are arriving on the green, but obviously this isn't the side of the green I've shown you. These are the four original Darleston cottages with some of the ladies looking out who sell teas when the cyclists come. And here, the first shop there in the newer Darleston row is um, Warmingham's shop. And Miss Bett, or Bessie Warmingham, who I think died about 1952, um, she ran the shop and helped her father. This is her father's cart. Now, he may well have taken some papers around the village. You'll see some other pictures in a moment, but you can see all the advertisements here. Mm. I always feel rather sorry for... Miss Bessie, there's a picture that Basil, her nephew, let me have a copy of. And she was a, a pretty girl, a sweet-looking girl. But by the time we're speaking about, she was 40. And she had been courted for about 15 years by Johnny Greaves, the gardener whom I've mentioned, who may have grown Captain Banks's peas for him, the head gardener at Meriden Hall. They never got married. She never got married. And I don't know, it could have been her fault, perhaps, because she had a big responsibility. She was the eldest of two families. Her father um, lost his first wife, her mom, and he remarried and had several other children. So she'd have had a lot of responsibility for herself, her own two brothers and two sisters, and then four half-brothers and sisters. 
Um, I should think she had her hands full, but I never got the impression it was she who didn't want to get married. So she's distributing the newspapers, but I must add that with the wage for a farm labourer at under a pound a week, there was no way that most people of that um, level in society then could have afforded a newspaper. They would have to have clubbed together and maybe some of them, if they hadn't taken in their education very well, would have had difficulty in reading what was on offer. Could we have the next picture, please, Rodney? Now, this is another one that Basil let me have, and this is the family a bit later on, because you can see their skirts are rising, and, of course, in 1914, they would have been a bit lower. And I don't know who's who, I mean, I don't know whether this is his second wife. I don't know which Miss Bessie is. She's sure to be one of them. But it's worth seeing the end house at Darleston Row, which was like that when I first remembered it, because she was there. But she was in her late 70s by that stage. But it shows you a village shop, all sorts of advertisements. And that's where some of the information would have come and her father would have taken it out, perhaps as well, when he visited parts of the village selling things. Could we have the next picture, please? Rodney? Yeah, it's all right. Oh, sorry, I thought you... <laughs> I thought you'd gone to sleep. <laughs> Not quite. He's, he's tired, it wouldn't be surprising. Well, this is a really good picture, because here's Edward Warmingham. So I always feel he's an old friend. I, I've seen him on a, a lot of photographs, and I've read a lot about him. And this is his little girl from his second marriage. I think that's Connie Constance. And you see Warmingham, baker and confectioner, Meriden. So he's had a, a special cart made. And here's his baker's uh, here with bread in it. I think there is a loaf in it. And it's a posed picture. I don't know where he was. But you can imagine it would be quite easy to show a few newspapers and take them around the village to other farmers. Uh, next picture, please, Rodney. Um, some papers, of course, would be able to come to the local railway station, but then, as with everything, it had to be brought up from Hampton. This is Hampton in Arden um, station. It would have to be brought up to the village with another cart. But undoubtedly, the Birmingham <coughs> um, daily papers, of which there were two or three possibilities, would have come in on the... Um, the Coventry bound platform and have been left there and again you could have perhaps um, looked at or seen one of those and obviously um, Rodney very kindly looked into the London train and you might like to know that the train from Euston which would bring um, newspapers down to the Midlands down to Rugby for example had three coaches on the train leaving at three o'clock in the morning and arriving, I think, in Coventry at 11 minutes past five. And then there could be a distribution from there in the city, but also out into the surrounding area. So, you know, it's quite a slow business getting your news. It's imagining in no world with no radio, a very quiet, there's hardly any sound, I think, in the place, really. And the next picture, please. Can you sharpen it a bit? Okay, I've put this in because I'm going to show you something else that occurs later on in the story, as long as I get moving. Um, here, here, and here's the bull's head, so you can, and this shop, of course, this building is still here. This is gone, but that was um, the reading room, and the next slide shows you a bit better picture of it. Could we have the next slide, please? This was Sunnyside, and I've been inside there when it was a private house. But this, this building here was Meriden's reading room from about 1900, as far as I can tell. And it was supported by the Banks. Captain and Mrs Banks put on a play in order to earn some funds for it at Forest Hall in the April before the war began. <coughs> so they're active hands-on landlords. Um, and they try and earn funds. But if you think about the reading room in Berkswell that was built by the Wheatleys, it's obvious that Meriden's poverty shows up because all they could have was one room rented. And the aim was to build somewhere purpose-built 
And of course, that was ultimately achieved in one way. And where we are this evening is the descendant of the concept of a reading room, a village hall for this village. Could I have the next picture, Rodney, if I can go on to another topic? I want to talk a little bit more about the, the poor people of the village. I want to emphasise that although people are collecting cash for all sorts of things throughout the war, it's pretty hard going. And this is a typical older couple who spent all their time working, probably both of them raising quite a large family. Um, this is one of the cottages on forest ground where they lived. But if they couldn't make ends meet, they would end up being in the workhouse. Now, there are pictures of the workhouse. There's only one for which we have to thank Miss Dawson um, for that. But I'll talk to you a little bit about that before we move on to what happens at the beginning of the war. Could we just have the next one of the workhouse, Rodney, please? There's the workhouse, which I've been in, I'm glad to say, though I escaped. I actually, as a, as a girl in the sixth form at school, went to see some of the old people and, and talked to them. I wasn't, it wasn't suggested in my day you did it, but I thought it was quite a nice idea. Unfortunately, it looks a bit patronising in, in reflection, but I did actually go in and, and talk to one or two people on a fairly regular basis. And this picture um, dates from probably just after the war, but it's the only one that we've got... And to reach it, of course, you went past the thatched cottage, down Maxstoke Lane, and the sheltered housing, which many of you will know and got, perhaps got friends there, is on the site. The original building, the centre, was built in 1793 with extensions later on. And outside there was a big tramp ward because a lot of people coming through the village, men, women, children, even babies, were on the tramp looking for jobs. So we had an itinerant, an itinerant population here as well. So I thought you might like to see that. It's quite good to see it as a big picture. Um, every, throughout the war, the guardians who did their job for free met here in this building, this side here, I gather, where there was a special room uh, with a table and 12 chairs, 12 members of the committee, at the beginning of the war, Colonel Nutt, who was in charge of the 7th um, Royal Warwickshire Regiment, resigned. He said, I can't possibly carry on with my job as a workhouse guardian because I'll obviously be needed um, to help with the soldiery. And needed he was. In 1917, he won the Distinguished Service um, Medal. And there was a rumour that he'd been killed. And he put a little note in the newspaper to say, no, he, he wasn't killed, he was still alive. And uh, thank those people who congratulated him, uh, thank you very much. Eventually, he came to live in Meriden, and he's buried in a graveyard. Collected quite a bit of info about him, um, but I'll have to leave that for today. Now, the workhouse employed people as well as having volunteers. Most things were run by volunteers, and indeed many things are today. Um, but they also had to employ people to do certain jobs. And i just give you an idea of attitude, two little stories. There was a man called Walter Harris who lived in Croxall's house, um, down Eve's Green Lane, just past the Queen's Head. Um, he moved there when Miss Kitty Master died. She was the original owner or inhabitant there. Um, and <coughs> he, remember, he's looking after 18 parishes. And he's only got a horse or a horse and trap to take him around. And he um, asked the guardians, could you um, enable me to get a motorbike? because that would help me to get around. And they had just passed a vote of confidence of how good he was at doing his job. But they're very cheese-paring about spending money, because remember, the village is quite poor. And although they collect from lots of villages for this, the precept per year is £223. And they've got to run a children's home as well. In Cheryl Lane it was at that stage. So, you know, they're pretty hard up for money. And they said... Um, 
It's £43 for the motorbike and £24 to run it for a year for the petrol. Oh no, we couldn't possibly afford that. And somebody said they didn't believe in that sort of vehicle anyway. <laughs> Very old-fashioned, obviously. They weren't looking to the future. In the end, after a lot of grumbling, they said they could offer him £30 and he'd have to find the rest himself because it was really like giving him a raise through the back door. And he, I think he decided that it was no use, he couldn't afford to do it, because obviously he wouldn't have been paid a great deal um, for his job. And then another bit of miserable cheese paring. Um, in 1915, they decided that they'd have to cut back on costs. And it had been traditional to give the old men for Christmas dinner, or with their Christmas dinner, some beer. They decided in 1915 to cut out the beer to cut out the costs. You can imagine the grumbles. <laughs> and, very, and really, that you know, gave them a poor reputation. So this place obviously dominates quite a lot, although there are often not many Meriden people in. And we're moving really towards modern times because it's becoming a hospital and it's becoming for old age pensioners. Mind you, I did do a calculation to look at how many people. That 100 people consisted at the one end of a child under a year, and at the other end, wait for it, a man of 95. So there was a huge range in age of people in living in the workhouse, and there was a staff, a paid staff, to care for them. So it's like an old age pensioners centre, um, and it's also like a hospital. Times are changing. The concept of a workhouse as it originally was is quite different. Could we have the next picture? I can't remember what it is. Oh, yes, it is. It's, it's to show you the Meriden people, men, women, and children, are working in the fields. And this was given me by a lady. She said, um, my grandmother's on it, but I don't know which one she is. But you see, there's a lady here, there's another lady here, and there's boys, boy here, boy here. So you've got um, a mixed group of people, and that's hating up the Philongley Road. And I think that's a fantastic picture to see men, women and children working in the fields like that, with hand tools. As I said, it's all labour intensive. Next one, Rodney. And these two reprobates are outside the bull's head, <laughs> because those who'd got spare money undoubtedly liked their drink. I think from his clothing, this is probably a farmer. You can see his leggings and these uh, type of trousers. And this one looks as if he likes his pint. He's not going to go without it at Christmas because he's holding, he's holding a glass there. So they've come outside and had their photograph taken. I'm sure there were plenty of other people inside uh, like that. And next one, just to finish this little run. Um, you might like to see that uh, farmers had cows. And these are laboured in... Again, these are not allowed to eat much. They're tethered. The man who runs them is called a cowkeeper, and he lives here, house in Lays Lane, still there. And this field, I think it may be one of them that's been taken up by the new building, because somebody at the time who wanted to try and stop that building wrote to me and said, have you got a picture of a hedge um, um, sometime in the, in the 19th century, if possible? A pic and I said, picture of a hedge? All that time ago, and then I suddenly thought, yeah, I have. I have. I've got more than one. I've got a lot more of hedge down here because this field was used for cows. So I sent them a copy, but it didn't do any good, obviously, because it's built on. But it's interesting that, you know, these cows are tied up and they can only reach the food that's around them. That's to make good use of the field. And the next one, I think, finishes the sequence. Yes. This is a house that was burnt down during the Great War, and I had two accounts of it from two different people. I haven't got time to tell you, but I can tell you where it is exactly, because here, where its garden is at the back, is where the bypass runs. And if you know what to look for, if you are tuned to picking things out, a bit of its garden still exists. But of course, the, the house itself was burnt down, um, about 1916, and that's the sort of house with its thatch cottage. It's, oh, I think it probably dates from the 1600s that people, many people, were still living in. 
Uh, and it's a far cry from what you get at the end of the war. Um, I've forgotten what I was going on to next. The soldiers, I think, if I remember correctly. I don't think there's another... I'll just check whether there's anything else in the sequence there before we move on. No, the cows are the last one. So I want to talk to you about the men who volunteered. We have, uh, on my collage down there, there's a lot of young men who volunteered. Um, Lord Kitchener was made the Minister for War as soon as the war was declared. Um, he was uh, chosen, Lord Kitchener of Khartoum, with a, you know, a, a big um, background to fighting. And he wanted between 70,000 and 100,000 young men across the country between the ages of 18 and 25 to volunteer for the war. And if you wanted to volunteer, the place where you tended to go to was Coventry. Um, and you, there was a drill hall in Coventry and you could sign on in Coventry. And our local regiment was the one I've mentioned already, Colonel Nutts, the 7th Warwickshire Battalion. Um, but, of course, throughout the war, people were moved around. There was so much carnage at different battles that sometimes a regiment was decimated, literally, uh, if not more. And so they often sent men to make up the regiment somewhere else. And that accounts for some of our men seeming to belong to a regiment miles away. They've probably been moved into another one. But we have a few pictures. We've been trying to get pictures of all the men who were killed, and indeed any soldiers who fought. And there were 81 men um, who fought in the village, plus those who were killed. So we've got a large proportion of men who eventually went to fight. But until the spring of 1916, they are all volunteers. Could we just have a few of these quick pictures, Rodney? Um, uh, that's Meriden Pool, so that you can see where we are. But it's much bigger than it is today. You see, I've got another one from the opposite direction going right behind the buildings. And I've put that so you can see where we are for the next picture. Because next to it is Tory Row. And the number of times I've been asked, where was it? Is it around now? Well, it was pulled down in 1959. I remember it very clearly being pulled down. And here's Mrs. Sidwell's husband's name. He's one of the postcards he did. Um, I haven't time to tell you the history of it, but in here, very small cottages where several families where there were sons who volunteered to fight. So you get an idea of the background. Usually they're just listed as agricultural workers, but many of them had skills that were useful in the war, like looking after horses. <coughs> Could we have the next one, please, Rodney? Um, next door but one to the Warminghams, further on in Darleston Row, is the Cook's family shop. I like looking in the window because there's granddad shirts and all sorts of underclothes and things hanging up. No modesty, obviously. Um, Mrs. Cook had inherited it from her mom. Lovely story there. And over it, it says that Cook is licensed to sell tobacco. So that would be quite a popular shop. And there's something, this is an advertisement. I don't know whether it's a tobacco advertisement, but here she is smiling. It's mineral waters, is it? Oh, right, thank you, I've put me right. Yes, I think it says mineral waters here, or table waters. Could we have the next one? She had two sons, and here is her younger son. I found this uh, recently, and I must hand it a copy over because we need it for the publication. Here he is, young man, 18 or 19, smartly dressed. He's gone to work in Coventry, and here he is because he volunteered to join the Warwickshire Regiment. Sadly, the last person that we um, went to pay our respects at the village war memorial, it was a very cold morning at the end of November, and appropriate really, I, I was certainly very cold standing out there, because uh, Stanley Cook um, died of exposure, hypothermia, um, on the Gallipoli campaign. They didn't provide adequate clothing and uh, all their clothes were soaking wet with very bad temperatures at night. And he didn't survive one night of November the 28th, 1915. 
sadly, there's something in the paper about him at the time, it was the day before his 20th birthday, and I felt that was particularly <coughs> sad and must have been replicated with all sorts because there were other men who were injured uh, and killed and so on. Um, so um, I'm not sure what the next picture is. Can you go on? And this? I think it might be... Oh, yes. This village had um, a penchant for the Red Cross, and many people collected throughout the war for the Red Cross, and they were here in the village. The headquarters was Coles Hill, but they used to come up to Forest Ground. And these uh, are useful pictures. Uh, they are, this is uh, the, the memorial, the, uh, not the cyclists, that original memorial on the green, and behind them is the Straight Mile heading for Hampton. But here they are all posing, and you can see the Red Cross there, and there are two more lovely pictures. Fortunate to have them. Can we have those as well? Oh, that's a similar one, sorry. I thought we'd got to something a bit more exciting. The next one must be more exciting, sorry. Yes, this is on forest ground, and this gives you an idea of manoeuvres, doesn't it? Because this is what it would be like when they went out to the Western Front, and here they've got their <coughs> everything on horses. You see, here we are, they're all manoeuvring with horses on, on forest ground. So the people who collected for the Red Cross, as they did regularly uh, throughout the war, small amounts, not a great deal, but they tried very hard. Um, they would have seen these, and many people actually joined them, the schoolmaster and also Mr. Edgington, who was the master of the workhouse, were both in occupation, too old to join up anyway, but in occupations which uh, meant they shouldn't have to go to war, but they both joined the Red Cross in order to do something at the beginning of the war to help. And then we have one more here, the, the last one. Uh, this is the soldiery, also on forest ground, and I think these, I don't know, I think the Red Cross, I don't know, but there's a band. You see, they've all got here, they've all got um, musical instruments, brass band. They had a brass band um, on that uh, bank holiday when uh, Mr. Captain Banks won, for, won his uh, prize for the peas. The Coventry Silver Band came out. So bands were popular at the time. If you went to the seaside, you'd probably hear the band. But you, people in the village were used to seeing lots of people in uniform at the beginning and during the war as well. Next one, please, Rodney. Now, I have to move on because of time and other things to say. But I want to move on to 1916, because 1916 is uh, the war is deepening, it's the year of the Battle of the Somme. And I found in the newspaper um, about a special service uh, that they had in the Meriden Church um, in the middle of 1916, in fact, um, while the Somme uh, campaign was really still on. But I thought you might like to look <coughs> at this, because this is what the church looked like at the time, and there were renovations later on, and if you go and have a look today, you will find that there were some windows here, but they were all blocked up at the time. It hadn't been done up. So that's the outside, and I think the next one is inside, though it's um, a rather poor picture. I don't know whether we can sharpen it anymore. We might be able to a bit. What is interesting is that Mr. Digby, who was a cousin of the owner of Meriden Hall, Mr. Digby, the, the father of Mrs. Banks, uh, he was the vicar from 1903 to 1916 when he was 60 and he decided to give up the Meriden living. But if you've been into St. Lawrence's, and I'm sure you all have, this is still here, still got that. And if you could only see here a bit better, he was responsible for putting in this altar table and for putting in the choir stalls. So we haven't really changed what Mr. Digby put in um, and was there at the time of the Great War. It's still there for you to see, but there are a few improvements, of course. We haven't got any of these oil lamps, for example. It was very primitive. Um, you had to, uh, to get some heat in. Uh, Mr. Greaves, once again, features because he was uh, the verger for quite a long time, and he stoked up every Sunday. And if you wanted the organ to play for you, and obviously they did, 
because the um, service that I found out had hymns and it said what they were. It was a hand-pumped organ. So somebody had to produce the air in order for the organ to be played. So it was a pretty primitive place. But I thought we'd have just a look at that because they were putting this special service. And what interested me was it said, and it was before two more deaths had been um, uh, notified, that there were seven men already killed out of the village, 12 men were injured, and one um, was a prisoner of war. And I managed to find in another bit of the paper, uh, I think the following week, the names of all these people. So I'm busy following it up because we've only got 13 men on our war memorial. It's obvious that men who grew up in the village are not on our war memorial. Um, they're often on another one. I hope nobody's been overlooked. But it's possible, of course, to find that out because there are um, books that will tell you where people are commemorated. One of our men is commemorated in Berkswell on the memorial there. Could we have the next one, Rodney, please? This is the, uh, where the vicar of Meriden lived at the time, because it's a long while since he had. He was a bachelor, so he lived there with just a gardener at the back there with some accommodation. And he also employed Mr. and Mrs. Franklin. He'd been the policeman. And when he gave up that job, he employed him and his wife uh, to look after him. Um, the next figure who came lost his son the following year, um, in, uh, far away in the Far East, because it was a world war, and we often forget some of the other theatres of war. The next one, please, Rodney. And this is what um, Moat Farm looked like. Quite different, because you see it's all covered with stucco. And you can't see any of the half timber, which you can see. I put that in because... The farmer there, Worthington Davis, his son was called up under the new rules. At the beginning of 1916, the government said um, all men between the ages of 18 and 41, um, first of all, if they were single or widowed without children, um, must be called up because we're running out of men. And then they made that more stringent by May. They had said that people working on farms would not be eligible, that schoolmasters would not be eligible, but they had to change it because we start to run out of men. So you'll find that um, people who were working on farms and George Davis, the son of the farm, was called up and um, ultimately he died of wounds in uh, January of 1918. Uh, somebody, a member of the family, told me that Mr Davis was too heartbroken to carry on farming. He rented this farm from the Aylesford estate and he just uh, he gave up after a short while when he'd lost his son because they were really, I suppose, in partnership together. Again, the sort of thing that you'll find all over the place. It, it just happened again and again. So um, what you had were people appealing against this, tribunals. And about 1990... Um, Mrs. Point and Clarice Point and rang me up one day and said, can you get down here? Because I've got someone you'd like to see. And it was a cousin of Mr. Dale. And she wanted, or he wanted to tell me his experience during the Great War. And I remember what he said, that he worked for a farmer at Arley. And there was only he and the farmer because everybody else had been called up or volunteered. And it was 1917 and he was about 18 at the time. And uh, he said that the farmer said, let's try and um, get, get you out of it because I don't know how I'm going to carry on. I can't do the farm myself. Who am I going to get to help? And so they went to a tribunal to discuss his case at the workhouse. And I didn't know our workhouse had been used for that. But they went there and they discussed the issue and they gave the farmer, I think it was three months to find somebody else. Now, finding somebody else, of course, meant taking on women. And many farmers were very prejudiced against having women doing men's jobs. The men, you see, had taken over the milking um, on farms. And, of course, they did the ploughing. But by this time, women were training with a, a women's land army. And I'm anxious to find out the two Meriden women who got um, top awards for being very successful with their farm work. All it said in the paper was that two Meriden women 
had got awards, top awards, but I don't know who they were. I, I'd like to know. I mean, maybe somebody would be able to tell me. Maybe they were somebody's relative. But lots of women were actually fulfilling men's jobs in all sorts of ways, as I'm sure you know. And so were children. Um, they said that no boys under 12 could take extra time off from school because they needed to be educated up to 12. But if they, as people often left school at 13, um, at busy times, of course, they could go and help. And we'll look at one of the farms where somebody was in trouble. Could I have the next one, Rodney, please? Um, uh, we've got someone in the audience who was kind enough to let me have a picture. Um, I look, but there are several pictures down there of the family. In this set of cottages lived the West family, the Thomas West and his wife Mary. And they had, I think, five sons who'd all gone off to fight. I think they were all volunteers. Um, and um, in uh, the new rules meant that they had to reward men who were being called up without really perhaps wishing to go. And so before, it had only been officers who got medals, but they made a new medal at this time. The military medal was for non-commissioned officers and for other ranks. And our first hero, I've put Merit and Hero on my collage. Um, his parents live in this, one of these cottages, and Dad very proudly sends something to the local newspaper in Coventry to say that his son Charles has been awarded the military medal. It's on the Somme. He'd already been wounded, and uh, he wants everybody to join in the celebration. So that's Meriden's first medal, as far as I can tell. And um, we have his photograph, because family members have supplied photographs of all these men. So that, again, is something to keep in mind. There was some good news, if you like, because people were getting their just desserts in that sense. Next picture, please, Rodney. I uh, thought we ought to have a bit about the chapel. Shameful if I just stick to the church. Um, there is a nice drawing of the chapel. This was here from the 1870s, was the Methodist chapel. And the Methodists were doing their collections as well as the Anglicans. In August of 1914, they collected two pounds um, for a, a good cause for the war. And we also learned that um, the regional, because Methodists have a region, and um, somebody travelling, really, who uh, actually in that time looked after the church. You didn't get um, necessarily the same cleric um, or lay reader coming to the church. You got several. But they had a, like, a regional um, party in summertime, um, I don't know, didn't, can, did I put a picture in of the house? I think I did. Can you see if I put a picture in of the house in Meriden where they had the party? Yes, I did. This is Holly Lodge, as it says, Holly Lodge at Lodge Green, still there. And Captain Perkins, obviously one of the richer people, because that's quite a smart house, um, made that available for the Methodist regional picnic um, in uh, 1915. As a, as a celebration. So ordinary things went on to keep people's spirits up, no doubt. So I thought we ought to just have that little bit about the, the Methodists as well. Methodism, very popular in Meriden. Uh, I should think as many people going to the Methodist chapel as going to the Anglican <coughs> church. Next one, Rodney. You have the next one, please. Oh, sorry. It's slowing up, is it? It doesn't like me. Right. I can't remember what the next one is. I have got the list of them here, but because I, I have to have some light to see what it is. Ah, yes. The Queen's Head Hotel. Another of the... We had no village hall, remember? So we had to meet at the school, if, uh, just here. Uh, we hadn't got a village hall. Or the pubs. And um, Thomas Hall at, uh, at the Bull's Head often had meetings and here in the Queen's Head, which had recently been done up, probably about 1906, Atkins's Ales had taken it over. Um, Colonel Nutt, who I've mentioned as being commander of the 7th, 
uh, was a rich man because he was the director of Atkinson's Ales. Well, I don't know whether he had anything to do with this because he lived in Philongley at the time, not in uh, Meriden. But that's what it looks like at the time. This came to me over the airwaves. Somebody sent me several pictures, um, and this is, a, this is off a postcard, but they, I, they sent me another one. Um, via the internet that was a photograph taken so I put that up on my collage I don't think that the, the Queen's Head didn't have anything to say the Hurtons, because still in the village uh, ran it at this time they'd come from Lincolnshire and uh, so they had taken this over I think in 1913 if I remember correctly um, when uh, Mary Ann West died and the next picture please Rodney We had some terrible winters during the war. And this is a, a real photograph of how bad the winters could be. But I put it in for two reasons. The winter of um, 1911 was very bad. The winter of 1914-15, lots of snow. The winter of 1918 and 1919, uh, I think it was nine inches of snow recorded. And, of course, this is right opposite here. This is Fern Cottage, and there's the road going up to Coventry. I should think it'd be very difficult to get up the hill. These are members of the Eisen family. I put them in because throughout the war, um, young men were being killed. And um, Edgar Eisen, uh, who was um, a volunteer before the war, he was a territorial army man, he went right through the war, came um, from Malta at the beginning of the war with his unit and fought on the Western Front throughout. And just um, a few days, really, at the end of October, mm -hmm. just before the armistice on the 11th of November 1918, he was killed. And I think that's terrible, really. Um, I don't know one of these is his mother. There's somebody looking through the window. I don't blame them in all that snow. These could be his sisters. Um, certainly the sisters often, or one of them in particular, often features in public meetings. But I thought you might like the snow, and I, I rather like that picture. You can see that it was a much bigger place. The barn was divided into two small cottages, and so it used to be much bigger. But all we've got left is that part at the moment. Right, next one, please, Rodney. Right, well, uh, you can have a look at that. I don't know how many of you have ever been up to High Ash. I believe there's a fierce dog up there, so you have to be careful. But this is one of the farms that use boys from the school. Um, and if you uh, look in the documents that from the school, and I've got a few things, notes, when, when I was chairman of governors, I had a look at some of the books. And... Um, uh, uh, Mr. Challoner, who was the farmer at High Ash, was in trouble with the school because he was allowed to have boys to help with the potato harvest in 1918, but he was hanging on to them. I suppose he got a lot of spuds and he didn't want to lose them, but of course these boys, no doubt, you know, I've been a teacher of teenage boys many years ago and I know that many of them were only too glad to get out of the classroom. If I used to go down and ask for boys to help me with jobs, there was a forest of hands to do it. So I think it was just the same um, in the First World War. But he was in trouble with the school board because, of course, they checked up on truancy and it was, it was viewed as truancy. Now, there were many hardships during the war and these would have been experienced by everybody. But in this village, um, a lot of allotments were set up to try and create food, uh, food supplies and so on. And so we had lots of women coming in and doing the work of men. And there was rationing. I think one thing might be worth just saying, that they did a survey to see where Meriden people went out of the village to get um, goods. And they found they hardly ever went to Birmingham. And that's what I used to think when I w lived in the village, that, most people went to Coventry, and that, that was the case in the Great War. They did a survey, and they found that most people went into Coventry. But when people were given ration books, it was very difficult, because the people in Coventry, uh, they were there on the spot and, and got things first, so Meriden people had got very little. And it said also that the, many of the shopkeepers were making their own rules and they were adding things that were not really on ration and saying, you know, you can only have so-and-so or it's very expensive. In other words, a black market developed. 
when I gave the talk before, I did say something about my mother's father because he was a businessman and he used to go out onto Corley Moor, um, sometimes collecting rents. He was a land agent and he collected rents for the owners of property and he looked to see about repairs. Though I don't think anything much could happen at the time of the, uh, of the Great War. But he brought, my mother said, she was about six or seven, he brought back some eggs from, from the um, farm on Corley Moor and they were sixpence each. Now, that is huge. It's old, old pence, of course, but you know, that's a huge amount to, uh, to pay for an egg at that stage because there was a black market developed. And if you could <coughs> afford to buy, well, the price, of course, developed its own. Now, I don't know what the time is, but I really want just to say a bit about at the end of the war, the jollifications at the end of the war and the effect of the war. And I think we've just got a few more slides, and Rodney can change those while I, I fill in. At the end of the war, which of course, as I'm sure you all know, was the 11th of November 1918, there was an armistice. There was a meeting of the um, parish council and people wanted to celebrate almost straight away. And Colonel Monckton, who was in charge, said, you know, don't be too hasty. We don't know whether the armistice will hold because he was a, a military man. He knew perhaps a bit more than the people who were on the committee. But um, within a, a very short time, they held a public meeting to which anybody could go. And you find women speaking, so maybe they'd felt, found their voice as well as their feet during the war about what they wanted to do. And there were various plans. They wanted to improve things on the green, but that never got done. Um, and they, want, they had it, um, a general vote. And it was put to it that they wanted that reading room, in other words, the antecedent of the hall, they wanted the reading room that the banks had tried to do before the war. And so Mrs. Banks, who of course was a widow, he was killed in the first year of the war, it gave the plot of land on which the um, club on Berkswell Road, you call it now, I always call it Lane myself, can't help it, there where the club is, that's where they decided they would put up um, some sort of hut. It couldn't have been very strong because it... Uh, it, in the end, it had to be pulled down the same year that we had the cyclist memorial. Um, there was a, a free dinner given by the publican at uh, the Bull's Head for 60 returning soldiers. Everyone had a good time. And Mr. Wrench, whom I think I remember very well, and perhaps many people in the room will, um, he played the piano for a sing-song. And he also went to the workhouse on the day that they had the, the big celebrations the following summer and helped the master and matron all day with the old people and was very much appreciated, it said. I wish I'd known he'd done that because I could have spoken to him about it, but I just didn't know. And he was a lovely man who worked and played the organ at the church until I think he was about 85. And I always remembered him saying he was very sorry he couldn't manage any longer because he was so arthritic. Um, anyway, um, there was a big jollification on what was called Peace or Joy Day. Um, that was the 19th of July of 1919. was held in the grounds of Meriden Hall, thanks to Mrs Banks. It was rotten weather. It was raining, just like my talk began. It was raining again, and they had to call a lot of things off. But the children's part of the party went quite well. She'd hired the um, marquee, so nobody got wet while they were eating. And then the adults had had some games. This, this village always had the adults taking part in, you know, egg and spoon race type things. There were loads and loads of races which people took part, men and women. And uh, they got rained off, so they had to come back again after work the following Monday. But they had, a uh, lot of people gave things. It was, you know, food was given, um, lots of people gave help, and Newcombs um, lent their cart, which they were a carrier's company, at, at the Burnham Cottage over the way here. And there's a picture of them on my collage. Um, and lots of people, um, the Shirleys, gave um, space in their house, I think to collect the food probably, and so did Thomas Hall, the man who had given the party the previous spring. And also, there was another children's party. Two ladies, two mothers, 
decided to give a special party for the children. And they had it, um, a, a, I think the children who came to the school here, because 120 children are uh, not listed by name, but 120 children joined in a party, which the moms put on. They collected the money. Um, they had cakes and, I don't, know if, I don't know what they drank, but the lemonade or pop of some sort, um, in a field that belonged to one of the Nicholds. But I don't know which field that was, but somewhere near the green. And the children all collected at the school on both of these occasions with flags, is very uh, patriotic in a way that would not be allowed, I suppose, today. It would be politically incorrect because they march from the school up to the green singing patriotic songs, Royal Britannia, the national anthem, uh, you have it, and waving these flags. Uh, and then they set about demolishing a large uh, amount of food that these moms had collected for them. And then on the day that I've just mentioned, Peace Day, they did something very similar. But the village wasn't the same as it had been only four years before. There were, there were a lot of changes in the village. It had become, in some respects, quite modern. Just before the war broke out, the Midland Red Bus Company had put on a bus from Birmingham to Coventry. And that ran every day, including Sunday. So, you know, you, you didn't take as much notice of Sunday as you used to. One thing, I was astonished that the government commandeered a lot of buses, and they also, of course, needed petrol. And petrol, I'm sure you'd be interested to know, was one and six a gallon um, as the war broke out. But within, a, um, I don't know, a week, it had gone up to three and six a gallon. Huge inflation for all sorts of things. Uh, food was just the same. Even perishable food had gone up. And some of those prices, of course, would stick because you find that once something's gone up, they don't come down again. Um, so the bus company is running. Somebody had said in 1915 that the road through Meriden was the worst one in Europe because it, hadn't, it had got no proper covering, it had got no proper edging, and there were lots of accidents. The Meriden Hill continued to be the black spot what it had been since the 1600s, where we've got some records of people being killed. And there were endless accidents, um, people being killed in cars, uh, dog carts, you name it, bicycles, anything. It was really a very dangerous spot. So you've got huge um, growth in road transport uh, that you wouldn't have had before. People commenting on it and, and the dangerous road as well. And so they had to widen it, of course, after the war. It was widened on a number of occasions and it had um, sets put in uh, to make it easier or very noisy on the road. Um, the Earl of Aylesford, who will feature on, quickly on one of these um, slides, um, he sold up a large portion of his estate. Can we just have the last few pictures so that we can finish? Um, I put this in because I wanted you to think about uh, Frank Jones, and this is his what was his shop a little bit later on. It remains looking like this. All of this is gone, of course. Um, the tree here. We've got a bit of this building, which is two shops, and this road um, has been <laughs> a transport road. Um, but that's where he was, and he was in charge of a lot of the arrangements for the peace celebrations. He was the chairman. Next one, please, Rodney. And there are some of the children who were just marching up and down the village, uh, waving flags and singing. Here's Mr. Penrice, slightly, I think this is perhaps at the beginning of the war, because he looks quite young. He came here in 1903, and he remained till 1939. Next one, please, Rodney. The Bull's Head, this is the part that the Shirley's had and presumably this is they stored some of the goods for the party, and this section of it is the bull's head, there, where Mr Hall was so generous, not only with his dinner, but all through the war he'd been collecting for parcels with cigarettes and tobacco and socks and things for the boys on the Western Front. Good man, obviously. Next one, Rodney. Meriden Hall, where the jollifications took place at the time. It looks as if there's a bit of a party here with this, but still a private house. Mrs. Banks um, left 
she, she left at the beginning of the war and she only came back for really a couple of months in 1947 and she put it on the market. It was um, auctioned at the end of the year. So she, that was a big change. You know, she didn't make it her permanent home, though. She's buried in the graveyard with her father. Next one, Rodney, please. That's the back of the house, if you want another view. I don't suppose they let the kids play on these rather elaborate gardens. They had rather good gardens. That gives you an idea that the grounds were beautifully kept. Next one, please. Another one of the children. And then it says Meriden number one. I think this is a post-war one by the appearance of the children's clothing. So perhaps that's some of the 120 who joined in the two parties. Next one. I thought I mentioned that the Earl of Ellswood put most of his estate up for sale in 1919. His son, the heir to the estate, was killed within a few weeks of the beginning of the war, leaving him with just two small grandchildren. And here he is in the... This is he here... Um, in this photograph of the woodman taken just after the war. He died in 1924, but from having one person owning a large portion of the village, he'd been collecting the village since uh, 1618, and so 300 years later, he has to sell nearly everything. There one or two farms and businesses left, which gradually were sold during the 20s and 30s, but from being an estate village in many respects, with that and Meriden Hall, it became just a village with no one person in particular um, owning or being in charge, which I think is not too good for a village in some respects. It would have been better in the 20s and 30s to have had some leadership um, that would have uh, helped perhaps the village to develop. Next one, please, Rodney. We're almost at the end there. It's sticking, is it? I thought we would have to have, and the, the lady who gave me this is in my audience this evening, but this picture shows us the cyclist memorial. We could have a whole lecture on the cyclist memorial, and all I can say is that we were specially chosen from the whole of the country to have that memorial on our village green, and it'll be 100 years in 2021. I'm hoping I'm still alive um, so that I can take part in some celebrations but we used to be very proud of this I remember when I was a child it was a big day as far as I can see in the village and my mother used to have visitors um, relatives and friends who would specially come uh, to take part and of course the numbers have dwindled in between the wars there were thousands of people 10,000 8,000 and so on even when the weather was awful from all over the country but I think we should be justly proud and there's um, wonderful details of how people walked past this and down on the other side. And it says in the newspaper, um, the men with bowed heads and many women crying. It must have been a very emotional time. And this is a picture, say, of the very first one. You can tell if you've got it because all these rather significant are piled right up high on there, and I've got lots of them from different years, but this is definitely the first one, I know, because the people who gave it me have said that. And you can read that um, Charlotte Nichols' shop is still there, and of course it's turned into a shop today. But I went in once into the flower shop a few years ago to buy a Christmas wreath to put on my dad's grave, and I said, oh, it's nice to be in Elm Tree Farm, and they looked at me as if I was mad. I said, what do you mean, Elm Tree Farm? I said, this is Elm Tree Farm, didn't you know? They said, no, no, it's lunk out again. I, I did buy something, but you feel a bit daft, you know, when somebody <laughs> says that. <laughs> Not that I take too much notice of appearing a bit daft. I think there's two or three more just to finish off, and you can see its position. They're all old, old pictures, postcards and so on. Will it not go through the rest? Is it playing up? Playing up. Well, I, I put one or two more. I'll just say then, in case he can't get them through, that when it was put up, it was meant to be near the road. That was one of the rules that they made. That's um, probably the next year. But it was actually up well onto the green. But it was meant to be somewhere where people travelling on the road could see it. That was one of the rules they had. But gradually, changes took place to the green. 
and I'm busy writing that up, so when you get your next mag, you'll find part two of what happened to the green in uh, the last century, and I should be talking about a change in the shape of the green and how this, uh, in the end, ends up just on right on the end of the green, whereas it went much further on, obviously, when it was first put there. And somebody actually remarked that they hadn't been for a bit and they were disappointed to see that the memorial was almost in the road, whereas it had been in the middle of a nice green patch. Can you get any more of or not, Rodney? Maybe. <laughs> uh, I'll carry on talking, just finish off then. Um, Lots of changes in the village in terms of accommodation. Remember that grotty cottage I told you, as I said, was set on fire, probably by accident, in 1916. Um, a couple of years ago, when I was uh, in the tent, when we got the mega ride, and I was talking to all and sundry, um, some, somebody said, oh, my, I think you knew my grandma, and mentioned somebody. I said, oh, yes, she lived in an odd fellow's house up Philongley Road. And she said, what do you mean? Um, so, although she said that she'd taken Grandma's house over, she didn't realise, perhaps she hadn't seen the title deeds or it wasn't clear, that the houses, the 1920s houses in Philongley Road, were built by the, the Odd Fellows and they were tenanted and eventually bought by people who were members of the Odd Fellows group. So, there were better houses coming in the village and um, Digby Place, I think, had a backing from the local authority because after the war, local authorities could actually put up houses and uh, the meetings at Coleshill of the Meriden Rural District Council were talking about houses um, owned by the RDC <coughs> for people to improve their living accommodation. So you've got new houses of a different sort coming into the village. It didn't make it that big, of course, but it's the first leg of the houses such as you've got later on in Allspath Road and on the other side of Philongley Road, it's all part of the continuum. You can see, if you look carefully, here's Elm Tree Farm. It's before 1923 because there's the tree in entirety. And here it is, and you see that it goes on quite a long way. And also, they'd put stumps to stop people using this road by the blacksmith shop. It's a bit silly, isn't it, if there's a blacksmith shop? But they didn't want vehicles, didn't want uh, petrol vehicles going down that road. There was quite a lot of fracas in the parish council about that. I think there's another one, isn't there, Rodney? Is there one more? Yes, and here it is. I thought you'd better have it here. You can see it here. And cyclists, and here's some cyclists. And if, if you don't know the village in the past, you can see Rose Cottage, and the, uh, here the end of Tuckies, and the Chestnuts, individual houses there. And of course, just beyond them, there were three houses built early in the 1920s, one of which is the present post office. There were other changes in the village as well. Um, these, lots of these, up, eventually up Meriden Hill, so that there was communications of uh, using telegraph, and also things put in at the water tower. Not that the village benefited by most of those. The water tower improvements were really for people quite a long way off. Um, it collected so much water, and some of it was right, used right over in Leicestershire in one direction, and in the south of the county in the other. I used to think the water was for the village, but obviously it was a much bigger scheme. And it did say about um, wells and so on being tested, and I know in my house, I remember when I was about 10, um, going out to the pump, I often think of it on a cold winter's morning, and I haven't got to do it, thank goodness, uh, but I used to go out with a bucket, and I had to keep some water to prime it, because I had to go and get a bucket of water, and it was very cold, and uh, a very uh, miserable job, but it would have been quite normal for so many people. So there were these big changes, the village had moved into a different sphere, and lots of people who had been farm workers, shall we say, in the village before the war, they didn't come back. Not because they'd been killed, but because they saw a different world. They had a broader experience. And they obviously saw the chance of other jobs. Perhaps they married somebody in another area. Perhaps they moved into the town. But it's part of the move, of course, that the countryside the people of the countryside, who I think people like myself as a, as a country person, um, moving into the town, loads of them, particularly the men, 
uh, and not coming back to the village. But of course, new people came in, and we also lost people from natural death. Um, Colonel Monkton died at the end of 1919. Other people would have died, like the Earl of Ellsford in 1924, and, and that made a difference to society in the village. I don't think I'd better talk anymore because I've talked too long as it is, but thank you for being such a good audience and um, well-behaved and nice and quiet and no brickbats thrown at me. Thank you. If you want to ask any questions, if anybody wants to, they could either try me individually or you can put your hand up. I don't mind. Oh, oh, how nice. Thank you very how much. Pretty. Oh, I wept. Oops. How pretty. That is kind. I didn't expect to give. There are some thorns. So oh, it's very nice. Fair. How nice. I shall enjoy looking at those. I must take a photograph. Thank you. Thank you.